everybody. Be sure to share this video. If you're on Twitter, hit a retweet. And if you're in here already, just drop a like, please. Uh, this is a this is going to be a special moment, I think. So we're going live on the screen. Dun, 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 dun. All right, Mark, we're fully live now, man. Um, I just want to introduce you. Uh, Mark Sargent has been uh, an integral part of my process in um, awakening to a certain type of thing. I know a lot of you guys watch my 3 a.m. streams and have heard me talk about Flat Earth, but I've never really did a deep dive on it on my channel. I mean, I've talked about NASA, I've talked about space, I've talked about my encounters with uh, extraterrestrial craft, but I've never really sold flat earth to nobody because I, it does, I don't know. It, it's probably the craziest thing to talk about publicly without people instantly dismissing it or having cognitive dissonance. Mark here, however, has, has done a channel, a very prolific channel, and has done a, uh, I would call it a documentary on YouTube called Flat Earth Clues. And when I first heard about flat earth, it was just a suggested video. For whatever reason, YouTube and Google was trying to entrap me with it. It was a suggested video on music videos. I did not understand. And like many of you, the first thing I did was dismiss it and go, ha 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 ha, flat earth is not flat. Who do these guys think they are, Christopher Columbus? But I, I did the dumb thing, I clicked on it, I watched it, and I've been stuck in that rabbit hole ever since. When was that, Mark? Did you put that out, uh, 2015? Yeah, um, initially it was put out February 10th of 2015. That was the, the very first video, and then I finished all of them before the end of March. Oh, wow. So you've been at it for almost five, or a little bit over five years. Yep, now. five years. And as far as I know, you've done tons of podcasts. Are you in the hundreds yet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I stopped counting uh, interviews after I think around 300. And then Ooh. the YouTube channel, I've got over, I think, 1500 videos at this point. Uh, a lot a lot of them are a combination of Q&As and podcasts and other interviews that I've done. So yeah, a lot of content out there now. That's amazing, um, especially for you to go so hard on one subject. I find it difficult just to stick to the one music subject that I talk about. So <laughs> I can't imagine that this 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 process might be beating a dead horse with you so my apologies for no for no my... <laughs> no not at all i mean there's a reason i believe in a reason for everything i believe in fate i believe in destiny and i believe that if you don't fight it the world will take you where it wants to take you and for whatever reason the world wanted to take me down the flat earth path and I, i'm still on it yeah, yikes. And, and if I'm not mistaken, you said you came up with this or it hit you like a ton of bricks at 3 a.m. as well. Yeah, yeah. So I was fi initially I had started looking into Flat Earth in the summer of 2014 uh, just because I was conspiracy bored. I had looked at just about everything you could think of and I had an opinion on just about every conspiracy there was. And so I thought, well, I'm getting a little older. I might as well put this on my bucket list. So That's why the protected right. Biden, because if Biden goes down, Hold a on. lot of them... My phone just started playing. Go ahead. That's all right. <laughs> so, uh, so I looked at Flat Earth and I said, okay, I should be able to shoot this thing down in a weekend. And that, nine months later, uh, the night of February 10th, 2015, at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, 3.30, if you want to be more specific, uh, is when all of a sudden I had that Jerry Maguire moment where I woke up and had this epiphany. It's like, you know what? I'm going about this the wrong way. I think I, I, I'm going to go the other way and say that it's not a globe, that we're actually in a building in some sort of planetarium, terrarium, some sort of snow globe. And that's when I sat down, never had really done any video editing before. I had never narrated anything. So I just sat down and... It just came so I would never had such clarity in writing ever where I just wrote the entire like first auto, was it like auto writing like some people do like yeah you just practically with a great idea and you just start writing yeah yeah I wrote and I never went back and changed anything it was it wasn't like you know I wrote three paragraphs and deleted two of them I wrote the whole thing and then when I was done it kind of felt like what that Forrest Gump thing when he got to the end of the country it's like well might as well go back and <laughs> So when I got done writing, it's like, well, I might as well narrate it. So I picked up a, you know, a $20 stupid gaming mic and uh, I narrated the whole thing. It's like, well, I might as well add some slides to it and make a video out of it. And it took me all day to make that first, uh, that first video, literally all day. And then put it up on YouTube and started the whole process again uh, the very next day. You know, got up real early and did the first seven clues in eight days. And then wow. it, most of it was out of my system. And then I, you know, I, I, I could pace myself after that. 
So, so you did that with the intention of someone coming to watch it, kind of follow you on that particular path, and you were hoping somewhere along the way that someone could prove you wrong? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I consider it because I did tech support, high-end high, high -end tech support for really boring, really expensive software for years and years, uh, and did it remotely and, and did a lot of phone work, and I considered myself a fairly clever problem solver. And yes. so when I looked at this, during those nine months where I was just hammering on Flat Earth, you know, the T-shirt the says that I became a Flat Earther because I tried to d disprove it. That was very, very true for me. I was extremely stubborn to where after those nine months, I think I had answered just about everything that I could come up with, any questions, the outstanding questions. So I was like, but I, but I still thought that something was missing. So when I put the clues out on the internet, I'd say, with, and again, I put it with my name, my real name, my phone number, my address, real easy to find me because I wanted some academic to call me up and say, okay, here's where you went wrong. You forgot this, or you, you know, you added this and you made this sort of assumption and you can give up your YouTube channel now. And it was the exact, <laughs> it was the exact opposite. Everybody started contacting me except the academics. That was the weird part. And to this day, I have never had a PhD call me up and and want to try to shoot this thing down. It is so tough to get academics to even address this. So, yeah. That's powerful. I know one academic attempted to drag drag one of us, um, the brother B.O.B. I know he's watched some of your stuff, some of Eric Dubay's stuff. Yeah. And he came public through it. He did a series of mixtapes, which most of my tribe here is familiar with. Mm -hmm. And then a very curious thing happened that we have a, you know, quote unquote, serious scientist get on national TV and make it a joke of the sort. Right. And that threw me for a loop because they could have gotten anyone to address it. Matter of fact, they could have just not addressed it. it but the fact that they chose to and didn't do a good job at it, that was I, like the final blow for me. I was really surprised that Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I'm not supposed to say his name, but I'm surprised that Neil Tyson got on comedy central and did that monologue for six or seven minutes he didn't use any graphics and use any animations i mean he he did not bring his a game and it was, it was stunning it's like why are you even on television addressing bob it's like fine he put he used a little sound clip of you in his song which was a brilliant song by the way um flatline by bob and the but having i mean the media could not ignore that i'm sorry you have a grammy nominated rapper <laughs> going head to head against the, literally the world's most popular physicist. I mean, that's media gold right there. Yes. And that drug on for months. The media, you know, every single, you know, um, media outlet covered that. And that carried most of 2016 up until 2017 yes. when Kyrie Irving decided to come out, you know, on, on a <laughs> podcast, which was even better. <laughs> So. <laughs> yeah, him and a few other NBA players, some other rappers, some, uh, you know, verified checkmark personalities all kind of echoed those sentiments. But what's interesting about them tagging on B.O.B. is that they, they did a very effective magic trick where they highlight the messenger, a.k.a. B.O.B., you know, this guy from Atlanta, he's a rapper. What does he know about science? So they actually picked a very easy target, I think. And I think that was like a handicap match um, yeah. in terms of winning people's uh, trust or, you know, wanting to keep the narrative going. They, they fought the little guy. And I was like, that's weird. I mean, there's there's mad flat earthers out there who actually have the uh, the quote unquote proofs that they could talk about instead of it just being like, wow, where do you think this is? The 1400s? I was like, man, if y'all don't get off this TV. And, <laughs> <laughs> and they had Bill Nye, like everyone's finding those old Bill Nye clips where he put the, uh, and that's my favorite proof, right? Bill Nye has a table and he creates this mock ocean. And then they had the little camera pan where they show you like, oh you yeah, yeah, yeah. When, disappearing across. I was like, when, oh man, we gotta do better than this, man. They're, they're taking a beating. Yeah, when Bill Nye did that, and that was from the '90s when he did that particular clip, way back when, again when he was when he was super young, because. And again, I love the fact that the media is lazy enough that they will put Bill Nye on to talk about this stuff. And, and which is why I made a specific video about Bill Nye. It's like, look, he is not a scientist in any way, shape or form. In fact, even his wiki entry says he's not a scientist. The problem is, is he looks so nerdy that media can't can't ignore him. They put him on. It's like, well, he's thin. He's angular. He wears a stupid bow tie and a lab coat. He's, he comes off as more credible than an average PhD. People don't understand yeah. that when you, uh, when you go higher in your education, uh, 
te- you tend to lose some of your articulation. So I, PhDs are really, really dry. They are super, super dry. And the last thing you want to do is get some astrophysicist on there who answers in one or two syllables. So you put Bill Nye on. It's like, look, he's got a bachelor's degree in mechanical. <laughs> that was, and then he gave wow. that up immediately and went into acting. He wasn't even a Hollywood actor. He was a, he was a Seattle comedy troupe actor. Wow. That bugged me. By the way, I just said that that picture that I, I threw into chat. I just wanted to point this out, which I thought was interesting, which was so Kyrie Irving, you know, caught a lot of hell for coming out, obviously, because he's right. one of he was one of the, the, the top NBA guards, you know, destined. Is he destined to be a Hall of Famer? Yeah, maybe. I mean, he's very, very good. No, no question. But what I thought was interesting was like this guy here. here here's uh, Novak, Novak Djokovic, you know, number one tennis player in the world. Right. Right. Came out as a flat earther. You know, his daughter drew that drew that thing he's holding. And it's not only it's just him, it's his it's his freaking family. They never talked to him. I have not seen a, an article where, you know, you would think the sports world would have descended on him, and they didn't. I thought that was very, very interesting. Very curious. Like I said, they, they, they like picking their targets, so yes, to speak, to keep the narrative going. Yeah, they so do. Yeah. let's reverse engineer this problem real quick, because I have a few more people coming into the chat. Yeah. Um, and I know they're gonna have so many questions. So let's start with the most obvious question. Yeah. What does it matter what shape the 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 environment that we live in is? What does it matter? Okay. It do- okay. Let me let me um, let me frame it for you. It doesn't matter until you believe it. That's that's the Ooh. safe an- that's the safe answer. Because if you don't believe it, you know, because people have asked me, it's like, look, I still got to go to my crappy job. My kids don't listen to me and my wife's terrible and all this stuff. It's like, <laughs> what does it matter if the earth's flat or not? And the answer is, well, everything would matter. Uh, the, the big thing, uh, we'll look at the, the top three, which is um, academically, uh, every university in the, in the world you know the astrophysics and astronomy would have to be shut down the remaining physical sciences geology biology hydrology archaeology anything with anology next to it would have to be literally retooled from the ground up i mean academics yeah. would be just in chaos for years i mean libraries would have to be emptied out and refilled that's just academia world markets economically you'd have to suspend trading on world markets for months until you figured out exactly what the ramifications were but the big one, the super, super big one is spirituality, which is think of the, the five major religious houses of the world, which control most of the world's population. Um, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Yeah. And all you're, you would all five of those, you're giving them all leverage against science simultaneously. Yes. And you're asking them not to do anything. That w- and, and you're saying, well, why would they have leverage as well? Because if this is true, then the world isn't an accident. You're not some little tiny rock that's part of a big bang, part of this impossibly empty universe. You are this tiny little building that, well, tiny to them, but giant to us. the, The universe is basically a studio apartment and it was built specifically for you. And you have, you're here for a reason. And that is very, very empowering to a lot of people. And so, yeah, it, it means a lot. Why would it matter? Why, why now? Does that mean you still have to go to your job in the morning and your kids? Well, yeah, of course, that stuff would still happen, but it would change the tone. That's all yes. anyone would talk about would be for decades. That's that's what the world would focus on. And it would change how people think and say, well, what do you mean? I go, well, OK, would you still go to war if you knew this world was created by something that was not you? That something was bigger than you. Would you still cr- commit hate crimes? race crimes, sex crimes. Would you, in fact, would you do anything bad necessarily? I, I mean, I committed, I was pr- a pretty good person to begin with, but I will never do a malicious thing to another human being again. A gun to my head. Be like, yeah, pull the trigger. But I'm not going to roll those dice. Not, not, not now. So there you I go. I got it. So, so, you, so the way you see it, the spiritual ramifications, and I've been exploring this path too, Mark, but a little bit more differently. I've, I've reached this, a similar conclusion um, because of this, uh, because of an experience I've had with uh, extraterrestrial craft, so to speak, not necessarily extraterrestrial, but definitely wasn't made down the street. I tell you that, and it was so profound for me that I started to have to re-question and retool everything. So I started, you know, diving really deep into history. And when you dive into history, a lot of these crafts are represented on images. 
They're represented in books via descriptions of old texts, especially the Vedic stuff. The Veda, those guys seem to live in a parallel reality in terms of their framing of the world, even with the story of Maya and this being a sort of simulation, Shiva destroyer, Brahma coming after ever so many years to reset things. And that's paralleled again in the Old Testament and Genesis with Noah and the flood story. And then a very curious thing that they say, even in creating men, they say, let's create them to replenish the earth. And that's like chap that's like page one, chapter one. Yeah. So obviously there's a greater force implied in religious texts that created our current, uh, it's not, I don't, I don't know if it's species or not, our, our current iteration, our current iteration, according to religious sects, have a, a group of creators. And that's very similar to the Anunnaki and Sumerian story. But when you also look at those sects, they do not describe a globe model. There, there's nothing right. to infer that you're living on a spinning ball and that the sun and moon are millions and millions of miles away. And that more importantly, more profound, I think, there's no indication that people born here get a chance to fly out of it. So right. did you ever come across some of the more occultic or ancient stuff that kind of like confirms some of that for you? Yeah, I've seen I've seen so many different things. I mean, we've got um, uh, sheets out there. In fact, let me find one for you really fast. It was from the speech I gave in 2019. Um, it was a compilation here. I'll dump it in your chat. One second. Come here, you. There, um, it's a compilation of all the, the different cultures, and they all drew the same thing over the centuries and millennia. They all drew the same thing, and that was some sort of enclosed structure. Um, let me, let's just take the, the most obvious one, because you know we're in the United States, which is Christianity, which is that we would have been dead in the water if the Bible would have even hinted at some sort of globe. And yet the only verse, there's only one verse, and we went through it with a fine tooth comb. I mean, the, there's a massive Christian community in the flat earth movement in the United States. And there's only one verse that even remotely talks about, it, which is Isaiah 40, 22, which is he who sitteth, sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Well, circle yes. isn't ball or globe or sphere. Circle is circle. Your dinner plate is a circle. Your dining room table is a circle. Your pizza is a circle, so on and so on. And everything else, if, if the Bible would have had even half a dozen of those that would have sort of gone along the same lines, we wouldn't have had any traction whatsoever. People would have said, yeah, well, you know, Bible says globe. They would have been dead, literally dead. But it was amazing. There was only one verse and it's Isaiah. And yet there's so, every other verse talks about fixed, immovable, you know, the firmament separating the, the waters above and the waters below. Um, the story of Joshua, which I, I love so much, or mm -hmm. you know, the second coming where everybody can see, you know, the second coming simultaneously, which doesn't work on a globe and so on and so on. Um, the, the everything, ev and again, that's just Christianity, but everybody drew what they saw. Everybody drew what they saw. And that was, everybody sees the sky moving and they get, just have this feeling. So tell me, you know, that, that, that compilation I just sent you there. That yeah. says a lot, which is every culture. Find me a culture that didn't think like that. Uh, in fact, if you even watch a time lapse of, you know, type, type in like stargazing time lapse or night sky time lapse and watch it and see if you can snap out of the illusion, which is, is the sky moving or are we moving? Well, if you're, you know, you're down here, it looks like the sky is moving. Why isn't it moving? Right. You know, as well, because science says that it's us. It's not the sky. Well, that's kind of a problem because you were saying that before you even had rockets. But anyway, I could go on. That's interesting. The science says thing is very interesting since a lot of the things that science says they got from the Vatican Church. The biggest one, the most curious one was the Big Bang Theory. Right. That comes from church. So, yeah, there's something curious about the quote unquote supposed separation of church and state. Right. Where if you look at these cultures, these are their shamans. These are their intellects describing these things via text yeah and these are depictions on walls very old walls describing it and the most prolific one of course is the masonic stuff and we know the ramifications of that behind the scenes so what people like to do is saying that science as a monolith all agrees on this one thing yet the people who fund and back science are creating a whole different worldview and i don't think people can actually have those two ideas in their mind at the same at the same time they're like why would anyone do that why would the biggest question is, what would be the benefit in fooling everybody? And to be honest with you, I don't think the intention was to fool everybody. I, I mean, as far I as they tell us, I don't see everyone as, back there wasn't in on it. Yeah, I don't see it as a trick. 
I see it as a test right. more than, more than anything. People say, well, you're saying that God's a deceiver. God's lying to us. I'm just going, no, <laughs> God's testing you. There, there's a big, big difference. And let's say some government figured it out ahead of time and they, they figured out, it's like, well, people are going to, are going to discover this unless we hide it. And that's what the government basically did. They hid it for as long as humanly possible. Now, why would, why would God make, you know, make this into a test? Well, and I talked about this in the clues. If you don't do this, if you don't make the, create the illusion that we're in a solar system, system, eventually our human instincts are going to take over and we're not going to act natural anymore. The, the argument which I, I put in the clues, which was the wildlife preserve, which I love right. so much, which is you can take any animal species. Let's just take buffalo, for example. You put them in a thousand acre wildlife preserve with, you know, they've got grass, they got water, they got trees. They couldn't be happier. But the thing is surrounded by a giant fence. Right. Right. Buffalo don't care. They do not care. They're not going to care. They're going to live their life absolutely perfectly. You put and you could put a, a hundred buffalo, 500 buffalo, a couple thousand buffalo. They're not it's not going to matter even even if you up the numbers. Right. But if you put half a dozen people in there, all they're going to care about is the fence, which is, wait, why is the fence there? Why are we on the side, this side of the fence? What's on the other side of the fence? Who built the fence? Have we angered the fence makers? Maybe we can <laughs> sacrifice things to the fence. Get the, <laughs> get a buffalo. And, and you know, almost next thing you know, they're killing buffalo to sacrifice to the fence. The, I mean, and you know that full well, that's what would happen. And yes. so what I think happened was, you know, 500 years ago, the, it was a brilliant uh, answer, whoever built this place, which was just make it to where the fence doesn't exist. Tell people, you know, that, that there is no fence. My, don't even bother looking for it. Because again, if the, once we hit, especially the 1900s, once we discovered oil and the internal combustion engine, we had now the power to go look for things, which is exactly yeah. what we did. In 1926, we sent planes to the North Pole. And in 1928, we sent planes to the South Pole. As soon as we could build planes, we were sending them places. Why, why wouldn't we? And so, yeah, you'd want to, you want to keep this thing a secret because you want to delay it as long as possible. I think it's part of the process. I think this is a school and, but we're not, we're not told it's a school. We're not supposed to discover that it's a, a school until the very end. And then once we discover it, it's like, well, that's it. You graduated. You're done. So that's what mm. I think anyway. That's an interesting thought. So it's because the most profound thing about that is time, right? So yeah. I think a lot of people who tackle this problem forget that we don't get a narrative that's a matter of fact from anyone in authority until we can travel across the whole world. Right. I, I think a lot of people in their minds pretend like airplanes have been around for everyone forever and that, you know, this was just no duh. They saw this hundreds of years ago when they were on camels. <laughs> no, like... no. And that's, and, and that, by the way, that's, that's an excellent point, which, which I've brought up on, a, on, a, on several occasions and people just haven't gotten it. It's like, look, we've been teaching the globe for 500 years. Well, the United States is only 250 years old, which and in other countries, we're still known as the new world. We didn't even have a map of this place. So when people say, oh, no, the Greeks drew a globe, I'm just going, fine, they drew a globe, but they didn't even know where the continents were. So who cares? I mean, and but you're absolutely right. Until 100 years, 100 years ago, no one was flying. No one was flying, with the exception of uh, maybe a little bit of the military in, you know, in World yeah. War One. That was it. Our planes were literally made out of cloth and wood. <laughs> there was nothing. We, we had nothing. I mean, in fact, you even go back um, 70 years ago. And most people weren't flying. It wasn't until very, very recently, only in a generation, maybe two generations, that masses were flying places. And so it's just you, you don't you, you don't get how how recent everything we've had is. I mean, going back like like you tech to talk to kids now and they look it's like, look, 20 years ago, I didn't even have HD television. Right. Yes. We didn't even have I mean, everything was low res. The, the computers were crap <laughs> by com yes. by comparison. Smartphones, pff, what, what smartphone? What is that? Yeah. yeah. Smartphones weren't even a thing. Our our technology, what we've done, what we've ramped up has been very, very, very recent. So everything up until that point was just assumed, which in fact, I'll give you a quote. It, it, it's in the description box of every video I make. Uh, and it was something I just stumbled across, which was from George Orwell, you know, the guy that wrote 1984 years and years oh. ago. And he said, this was in 1946 that he wrote this. 
And he, he wasn't a flat earther, but he was he was talking about the responsibility of science and how people just believe anything that science tells them. And he says, you go to anybody on the street right now and you ask them how they know it's a globe. People will immediately say, well, pff, what are you talking about? We know it's a globe. It's known. It's a given. And then you say, really? Right. How do you know? And then they start getting upset because at that point they realize for the first time, it's not that they know, they've been told. And there's a big, big right. difference there because NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. Wasn't even founded. So how did everybody in the world know in 1946 that it was a globe? It's because they were told and their parents and their parents going back 20 generations that it was a globe. It was just burned into our heads by whoever built this place and the powers that be. It was easy enough to do because it because science became its own religion. Yeah. Um, r real quick, by the way, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about you know, like science gets away with stuff. Here's a perfect example I used in uh, my speech last year. Uh, let me drag this over here. So this is a picture of the uh, the coelacanth fish, and you can have anybody look this up. It's one of my favorite examples, right? Extinct, seventy million years. There you go, fossil record. What you know, part of the dinosaur era. Seventy million years gone, right? You right. would have bet every scientist in the world, they would have bet the farm, they would have bet everything they owned. It was a sure thing. Well, that's a problem because 1938, the British found one off of South Africa. And then another one off of Mozambique and Madagascar and so on and so on. And the next thing you know, National Geographic is swimming around with these damn things. Right. So what's, what's the point? My point is don't shoot down things just because science, you know, makes this statement. You know, are, are like are, all dinosaurs have been dead for at least 100 million years. And, you know, and like, for example, before Flat Earth, I, I always I thought it was kind of a neat kind of fantasy thing. It was like the Loch Ness Monster. You've heard of it. Loch right. Ness Monster. Are there dinosaurs swimming around some of the lakes in um, the UK? Well, yeah. can't be, right? Can't be. Because, why? Well, because they've been dead for at least 100 million years. And then I show you this fish. And I say, that fish has been dead for at least 70 million years. Obviously not. So, and you say, well, and, and no, it's just because you haven't found one yet. That's why. That fish was easier to catch. You can see the diver swimming next to it. It's not exactly skittish. However, right. if you were a plesiosaur or some water swimming dinosaur, why wouldn't you? Who's to say that there aren't a few of those things still swimming around? I mean, we've, we've heard about them in all the major lakes, not just in mm -hmm. um, uh, UK, but over in, in, in the United States as well, in Canada. So, so science will make mistakes. And the saying I like to, I, I know I ramble, but the saying I like to throw out at people is that science is only right until the day they're not. Yikes. You know, they make the statement, it's like, we're right. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, show them that fish. That fish, scientists do not like talking about that fish at all. <laughs> they go, um, well, it's a, they had to reclassify it. It's like, well, it's a living fossil. And, and so <laughs> like seriously, they make, they, and, and it's in an evolutionary state of stasis. It hasn't evolved for some reason in 70 million years. It's like, really? Really? It hasn't evolved for 70 million years. That's that, And that's the most remarkable part that people look over. Yeah. Yeah. It's like 70 million people. Again, the numbers throw people. It's like 70 million is such a huge number in the yeah. in terms of of existence it's such a huge number and it's like okay so why aren't the oceans just just filled with these damn things well i don't know for whatever reason they are balanced with nature they only hang around africa and they're out there and so oh. again so but my, my point is how did science screw this one up so badly how did they screw this up so badly and the reason is because they believe everybody that does work prior to them they think it's absolutely true so they look, it's like, who, whose work are they building on? You know, Neil Tyson says, well, you know, we're ba the work we're doing is built on the back of giants. You know, people, that, you know, the, the found, found founders of physics. It's like, yeah, but what if they were wrong? If they were wrong, right. then everybody that built their stuff on top of their work is also wrong. And which is, yes. why, why it's, it just falls like Jenga. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's, there's nothing to, no, there's not going to stand on. I'm not saying, and people, again, people will come back and say, oh, you're saying you're smarter than Hawking. And, um, and uh, Albert Einstein and stuff like, no, no, not at all. They're very, very smart guys and very, very math oriented. And they can crunch numbers like nobody's business. But if the foundation that they built their work on is wrong, it's not my fault. It's not their fault. It's just they're wrong. Plain and, and, and that's the curious thing about numbers in general. You can balance the equation on both sides. So I hate that we have to use science 
when what we're really saying is math as justification for our experience because right. that doesn't seem to make sense for anything else that we deal with especially relationships religion and everything else like you start talking numbers and stuff I, I get why it's there I get why you need it and why we need people who know physics and why we need inventions and technology yeah but that that is a very dishonest way of going about it for instance like the difference between our system and the metric system right it's just sliding the scale of numbers right and you can get different combinations of numbers that don't have a name in their system that has a name in ours. So right. like if we start describing something in our system, do, do people in Japan or China go, there's no such thing? Of course not, right. you adapt. And, and I don't think this is a matter of it falling apart. I think they just don't want to foot the bill of adapting yeah. for whatever reason. I love, by the way, that the United States never adopted the metric system. I remember, I'm old enough to remember when they tried to do it back when I was in uh, sixth grade, the late seventies and they tried and the teachers was like, eh, we, we love the, you know, the United States is not that old, but even regardless, they, we love our traditions and we mm -hmm. love, you know, the inch and the ounce and the mile and the foot and, and all these different things that have, you know, st all these names are steeped in tradition. And all of a sudden you come along with this generic thing, you know, the hexameter, the decimeter and everything's part of something meters and, and or the leader. And we're like, yeah. Nah, <laughs> we're fine. <laughs> and, and the rest of the world took it. We didn't. I love it. Yes. Yeah. It was just like we're doing with Common Core Math. Once again, you know, stirring up the pot with the, for the next generation of Zs. But yeah. so in the chat right now, we have a few people chime in. And the most interesting or ex expected response I have is that I have a family member that works at NASA. Oh, yeah. This is funny. So... What's my that? take on that is working in a space center or for NASA does not imply that your job is to know that the earth is flat around. Um, what is your take on that when people do uh, the referral? Oh, to no, no, I don't. That, it's fine. And I'm not, it's fine. It's great. And it's, by the way, it's very deliberate that so many employees work for NASA or work for the subcontractors that work for NASA, by the way, which is a military organization. It is absolutely part of the department, department of defense. But what I'm yes. saying is, because the one of the first responses from people like that will come back. They'll say, well, it's such a huge conspiracy. You're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of scientists and, and everyone that's ever worked at NASA. It's like, no, very, very, very few people at NASA would ever have to know any of this stuff. Because the only guys, if I was going to do it, because I've been accused of being the greatest secret agent in the world from time oh. to time. Um, if I was going to do it, I would treat it no different than the movie Capricorn 1, which is you only the telemetry guys. And if you don't know what telemetry is, it's when the rocket gets out of visual range and the only thing you have left is the numbers. Kind of yeah. like when a plane goes off in the distance. It's like, well, okay, we've got its latitude and longitude, right? Well, the rocket goes off you know, in, in the distance. Like, okay, we know where it is based on these numbers. If you have someone that can fake those numbers, you can do anything because you remember, remember it's out of visual range. You just have yeah. to go on their word. It's like, okay, well, we think this rocket is 40,000 miles away from the Earth. Yeah. You have no way of verifying this whatsoever. You have to base it on their numbers. So only the telemetry guys and only their bosses, which again, straight out of Capricorn 1, I highly recommend it. It was a wonderful independent film in the late 70s, which was about a fake Mars mission and how easy it was to fake a Mars mission. Very, very, wow. it was a, such a weird movie. O.J. Simpson was one of the astronauts of all, of all things. And so, so they have predictive programming right out of Apollo missions? Sure. sure wow. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, pre, pre, I wild. mean th think of it this way. I mean, well, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So Capricorn 1, the only reason it was made was because when they filmed, again, the average person doesn't know this, the, when they filmed the, um, or when they broadcast the Apollo missions, you know, from the late 60s all the way up until 1972, they wouldn't give the networks direct feeds, which is unheard of. Right. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? We're waiting for the feed, you know, a direct pipeline to the network so they can give it the, the, the clearest signal as possible. They say, no, you have to bring a camera crew down to Kennedy and you can film it off a, off a projection screen. We're going to, we're going to broadcast on a wall. It's like, what are you talking about? Why the hell do we have to do this? Give us this feed. Nope, nope. That's how it's going to work. And they did it deliberately. So that's why it was so unbelievably grainy because they didn't want the production techniques to, to get out. And the networks were really, really upset about this. And one of the CBS affiliates, a guy that ran this station, 
he he said he goes hell he, after watching the the feed he's going he, it's not that he didn't believe that we went to the moon he just thought that the production was terrible he goes he goes i could make a better moon mission than this he goes hell i could make a better mars mission than this and so he did he made i don't think you could even make that movie today he made a movie called capricorn one that was done in uh, the late 70s six years at least after apollo had wrapped up where they went to the moon well i'm sorry went to, went to mars and the entire thing was faked once the rocket got off to a certain point off out of visual range they just ditched it in the ocean and ran fake telemetry numbers that's all you'd have to do to fake it people don't get i know neil tyson go black goes oh how expensive it would be to fake fake the the moon mission or the or anything it's like were you kidding do you not watch the science fiction stuff that we put out like gravity for example was beautiful it was absolutely yeah. gorgeous uh, you could intersplice any of that into regular NASA footage and it would be flawless, which means which is real and which isn't. Or go b even back to, um, you want predictive programming, go to the 1968 Academy Award winner, 2001 A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick. You watch that on Blu-ray today. Find the flaws yes. in it. There are almost none. And that's what we could do in 1968. exactly the same. Yes. So. Yeah, it looks exactly the same. And two things I took away from that that you're mentioning, yeah. that when we do have rocket... Uh, takeoffs, the number one thing that you do see is them recovering it out the ocean. So that's one. Yeah. And then two, when it comes to questioning when will we go back to the moon again, the answer given is that we lost tele telemetry data. Yeah. So it's almost as if they're nudging the conspiracy if there is one. So like, if we're all just stupid because there's something else going on and they're using these type of moments to keep us in the dark while they work on their secret plans yeah. to escape Earth at school, then cool. But for them to come out and have that uh, that new mission that they're doing. In fact, I think the mission is called Mercury, if I'm not mistaken. It's one of these missions where the NASA guy goes on there and he says, hey, we have this uh, problem with the Van Allen radiation belts. Oh, We're no, that's, figure that's it out. Orion. <laughs> Orion. That's yeah. Orion. I'm like, well, yeah. you guys are just trolling us. Yeah. And if you're not trolling us, that speaks to the brother who says, you know, his brother works at NASA. That's crazy yeah. because the guy leading or Orion or, or works at NASA and he can't get how they got through the Van Allen belt. Yeah. So I, how and convenient that's, is that? That is one of my arguments in it's a wonderful video. Anyone can look it up. It's on the NASA.gov website. It's called Orion trial by fire, which was made at the end of 2014. And it was a very well polished production where they were talking about what they were going to use for their capsules for Orion, which is also known as the Mars mission. And they said they couldn't even test uh, capsules with people in it because they haven't solved the radiation belt problem from the Van Allen radiation belts. And it's like, wh what are you talking about? You you solved it. You solved it perfectly. You went through yeah. it multiple multiple round trips from 68 to 72. You didn't use any shielding. You didn't use lead or gold or a whole bunch of water. You used aluminum and plastic. Nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody even got cancer. There's still five of these guys limping around today. How yes. no one wants to talk about this. And so, in fact, it's one of my big five questions. It's like, are the Van Allen belts deadly? Yes or no. If you say yes, then um, how did the how the Americans get through it with no shielding? And if you say no, then why is NASA running that stupid Orion trial by fire video? It doesn't it doesn't right. make any damn sense. Or it's or, a catch 22 for them. Oh, yeah, yeah it is. Oh, you, you can't win. It's a trap question. Um, the other part is, you know, which people, I love hitting scientists with this. It's like, why, and it was easier to do back in the eighties and nineties, but not now it's 2020. Why haven't we gone back to the moon? In fact, why hasn't anyone gone to the moon except for the Americans? It's staggering. I mean, we, we've, even if we didn't have the tech back in the sixties, we have the tech now to do this, but we're not. The Russians never went, the Chinese, um, you know, there's no person that set foot on the moon except for the Americans. And the response I get most often is the carrot on the stick, which is, oh, we're going. Oh, we're going. I go, when? They go, soon. I've heard yeah. this over and over. In fact, you, there's some wonderful compilations of American presidents saying this. Every American president since Reagan has said this, like, oh, we're committed to going back to the moon. Think about this. Reagan, two terms, uh, Clinton, both Bushes, Obama <laughs> and Trump have all said this, you know, it's like, you know, year after year after year. It's like, oh, well, we're giving, you know, billions. We're going to build it. No one's got there's, yep. there's no replacement rocket. There's no nothing. In fact, hell, even even Elon Musk, you know, who said in 2017, it's like, oh, we're going to send a couple tourists around the moon. We're not going to land. We're going to go around the moon. The end of 2018 was well, 2020. Nothing ever happened. He never built the rocket, nothing. never built the capsules. We don't know who the people were. It was just a story. It's it's 
they push it to the people and everybody in the back of their minds said the same thing. It's like, oh, well, we're, we're going back some someday. It's, it's like, when? It's 2020. We're, we're not yeah. going back ever. No one ever said, like, oh, we're going back soon. I have heard this story every year. I have heard this story and it's never, ever comes to fruition ever. Right. I've, I've noticed that too. I've, I've looked really deep into some of those old conversations that astronauts would have. And it just seems like a complete 180 spin from what, you know, what they were saying during Apollo and what they're saying now, almost as if these are two different organizations yep. trying to solve a problem that was already solved. Excellent and for point. for me, <laughs> Excellent and point. I was yeah, like, yeah. why is that a thing? Yeah, you're, in fact, I brought up the, um, the, the Orion trial by fire thing to, uh, actually a physicist who was, um, uh, oh crap, I can't remember his name off the top, uh, Stanton Friedman. The, the world's greatest yeah. UFO, the late Stanton Friedman. And when he heard that it was made, he was just, he's like, what are they doing over there? Because it's like that video should have never, ever been made. Why would you right. ever make a video in 2014 saying you can't get past the Van Allen radiation belts? Because you're right. It's like they have two separate organizations. It was like they forgot stuff. Like that there's enough, you know, because it's been two generations since the moon landing at this point. So yes. this, they forgot everything that happened. It's like, you guys realize you went to the moon, right? <laughs> you, you, you did, you did go. And it's like, and now all they care about is, you know, what stuff they can fake on the, on the international space station. How much stuff can they throw up there without explaining how it's up there? You know, like, right. like gorilla suits and guitars and, and you know, how much, you know, how many thousands of dollars, it's something like, something like $10,000 an ounce to put stuff up there, you know, if, if you believe yeah. it, it's like, so really you're going to put up a flute and a guitar and a gorilla suit and every NFL team's jersey. Sports jerseys. Yeah, the yes. jerseys. It just blows me away. So you can announce it or, or stuffed animals for the kids. And yeah. it's just, people just don't get it. It's like, it, it, it's the interior production of the ISS <laughs> is so horrible that I almost wonder if they're doing it deliberately because even even yes. I've met enough producers and directors over the last five years. Even your B and C list directors would not make mistakes that these guys have made. You just they're just terrible. Just awful. Snapchat Snapchat would do a better job yeah. uh with some of the uh replacement things that they're trying to do. A lot of those camera projections or some of those blue screen leaks that they have. Yeah. I'm like, bro, if you were trying to convince me this was real there is no way with all your budgets to the tune of billions of years yeah. that you're hiring this stuff off of Fiverr, bro, because I shouldn't be able to see that, man. Yeah. Like, you put the hairspray in your head, and you think, like, like so, so, Mark, I think that's what the problem is, right? Yeah. I think people are going to be offended if we say that, right, and they look back at it, because the, there's only one thing that your mind can do in that circumstance. If they're faking it or joking with you, basically, you, the viewer and believer, inherently, they're saying, I think you're that stupid that you believe this. And I think people can't step away from that and say that this agency that we grew up to love or learn would do something that brazen. So the alternative is, is like, well, they're just having fun to the tune of billions of dollars and not telling you what it's really about. Yeah. Like, there's no good answer to any of that. You're, you're, you're right in that capacity. It's, it's not that people are stupid. It's that they, people are only the accumulation of what we're taught. And yes. if you go through school, I mean, look, it was me included, and you're not taught much about physics or engineering or chemistry or, heck, now microbiology, apparently. If you're not taught any of these things, you can get away with a lot. I mean, you can get away with huge amounts. And plus, the movies do not do us any favors whatsoever, <laughs> like the, the vacuum chamber stuff. Um, you remember the end of the movie uh, Aliens, where Sigourney Weaver is, is clawing her way out of a, a decompressed cargo bay right and and the winds blowing by or it i don't know looks like less than 100 miles an hour mm -hmm. and to people to understand it's like that's not how a vacuum chamber you know how vacuum versus non-vacuum works it's second she right. opens up that airlock yeah the alien's dead and so is everyone else in that room instantly yes, in a instant in a fraction of a second this is not something that's debatable it's absolutely true i mean you can see the vacuum chamber tests all, all over the place it's it's absolutely instant. It's absolutely violent. You think I'm kidding? Take a balloon. When's the last? Take a balloon. Take a pin and pop it with a you know pop it with a pin, right? Mm -hmm. have, have you ever seen a, a balloon explode in slow motion? No, it doesn't happen. Why? <laughs> 
because that's not how it works. The second you put that tiniest pinhole in there, the whole thing ruptures instantly and it explodes yes. uh, or implodes, or how you want to look at it. So every time I see a movie thing that shows the, you know, w you know, pinhole, you know, that you're or a little hole in the in the fuselage like oh we've only got two minutes air left get the tape right <laughs> it's just leaking it's and just they leaking get and then, to fix it. <laughs> the, then the iss though uses that and gets away with it they had a hole supposedly in the fuselage from a micrometeor oh I don't know, two two and, a, two and a half years ago and they said they pl initially plugged it with their finger it's like yes. what do you not that is not how it works it's we're not talking about theoretical stuff here we're talking about basic physics basic basic physics uh, and I, I i gotta drive this home when it comes to thermodynamics then there are laws it's not a guideline it is not a rule it is a law which means it cannot be avoided that means pressure cannot exist to non-pressure without a barrier. And the stronger the pressure difference, the thicker that barrier has to be. Like why submarines, you know, military submarines are so damn thick. They're yes. feet, feet thick of, of steel, right? Reinforced steel. And, that is, and even they can't go down forever because, you know, that's what's called crush depth. Well, the same thing applies reverse. And that is if you have a, um, an object, in fact, you could look it up on YouTube, put, say, pop can in a, in a vacuum chamber, because that's all the ISS is, is a pop can, right? And, and remember, a soda can is, is mostly liquid, right? It's not all air. You know, you apply a vacuum, you know, to, to that pop can, it bursts every single time. Yeah. So why is the ISS still floating around? It's aluminum and plastic. There's, there's no way. Because that... Because I introduced the next question. Hmm. Um, if they're not close enough to the so-called uh, that barrier you're alluding to, then they're not in space at all. Oh, if they're yeah, up there. I, yeah, I've heard it. look, if they're if they're supposedly what four hundred miles up, they're close enough. the The pressure difference would be massive. I mean, come on, you you've seen. We all know the the stories on the ground. When if you're at thirty thousand feet in an airplane and that window next to you ruptures, <laughs> you're yes, getting it's over for you. sucked out of that plane. Everybody knows that. Every pilot can talk, tell you about depressurization of the air, of the aircraft at, at, you know, at those altitudes. You will absolutely get sucked out of the plane. People have, have done it. They've died. The, that part the movie does, the movies do get true. But when, and which leads to a whole other thing, which is where is the bleeding edge of space? Where does our atmosphere end and space begin? Where is it? Hmm. And people have said, there's all sorts of answers. They don't know. And so I go, okay, no. so what happens when the molecules get thinner and thinner? Is there just this part where there's nothing? You've got this, literally a vacuum sitting next to our atmosphere. And they go, yeah, yeah. I go, really? Because you can suck so, you know, you can take a straw and suck soda out of the bottom of a glass. No problem with, with almost no vacuum no force whatsoever. That's how weak gravity actually is. And yeah, people, uh, sorry, it just yeah, aggravates me. They don't get it. We're not yeah. we're not taught these things. And because we're not taught these things, the powers that be use them to their advantage. Um and, yes. and they get away Same with it every single time. Uh here, I here's here's a quick one I can I can give you. Here, look at this shot right here. It's a shot I, I usually throw at people um in at conferences at the end for talking points. That's just a regular old shot from Apollo twelve, right? From from nineteen sixty nine, nineteen seventy. Right, that, you sent me the uh, no to grass one. The what? Oh no! You, see, you sent me you Neil. See the um. Oh sorry, sorry. Hang on, hang on. No, not the Neil. Well, the Neil deGrasse Tyson quote is great. I also love that one where he says, "Science is right whether or not you believe in it," which is just aggravating. No, this shot here from Apollo um, Apollo twelve, perfect example. I, I throw this out at audiences and I say, I can count at least six things that are wrong with this picture, <laughs> at least six. And, you know, how many can you find? And people just start yelling out stuff because they can see them. I mean, forget about the, the fact that there's no stars in the background. Forget about that. It's like, fine, you want to say it's exposure settings. Great. I think it's a little unusual that no one at NASA ever even changed the exposure settings. So we don't have a star background in any of the thousands of shots that were supposedly taken on the moon. They perfectly took perfect pictures. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And these are gorgeous shots, by the way. Absolutely gorgeous. No, um, here's things again. We, we don't remember. We don't retain so much from school shadows one light source the shadows go in one direction yes. one direction all in the same direction parallel to each other they can never intersect and yet you see here the shadows are going in four directions yes that can they're only, intersecting too 
that can only happen if the light source is really, really close or there's multiple light sources. In this case, you can see the hotspot. You know exactly where it is. It's behind the guy that's taking the shot. Yeah, it's right here. It's, it's right there. Um, no blast crater underneath, you know, that's 10,000 pounds of thrust, supposedly underneath that thing. Not a, not a green is moved out of place. You know, if you zoom in and you can zoom in on this thing all day long, it's got, it's really good clarity. That, that particular capsule looks like it was made out of curtain rods. Paper and mache. Paper mache, paper mache, some, mache some, and aluminum. Some foil. It's horrible. Uh, one of my favorites, of course, is the, the thing that's overlooked, the, the giant VHF transmitter in the middle, right? That's just a straight up VHF transmitter, battery powered from the late 1960s. It has on a good day, a range of 50 miles on a good, right. on a good day. That's with Morse code. And it supposedly was beaming back two way communication, flawless plus 10 frames a second of color video simultaneously over 250,000 miles through a Van Allen radiation belt with pinpoint accuracy. What are they lining this thing up with? They have no digital crosshairs to, to line it back up at Houston. The moon would be this little dot in the, in the, in the sky. And they line mm -hmm. that thing up perfectly BS, not a chance in hell. It just goes on and on and on. I mean, it's, there's nothing, but again, because we took these pictures and we put them in Life Magazine and Time Magazine and National Geographic, people believed them. Why? People forgot the rules about shadows. They forgot the rules about electronics and engineering and how transmitters, how far things can go. They forgot the, how the splay pattern was supposed to be there. By the way, if this 10,000, you know, remember they're walking around on this ash, right? This, yeah. this supposed this ash, at no point did anyone dig down to see how far the, da the, the ash actually went. It's like no. this ash was supposedly covering what rock? Did anyone ever actually took, put a shovel and see how far down the ash went? You would have thought that capsule would have blown away most of the ash, and the thing would have landed on rock. Never did. No. Oh my god. There's not. There's not, a, there's not enough displacement for the craft. Period. No. Like its its feet is not deep enough in for for its weight, of course. No. And, you know, people will try to do the mental dynamics, dynamics or uh, gymnastics. Oh, but the gravity is a little bit different on the moon, so it was a light little Nerf gun landing. This, and I'm like, whatever. This, man. The spacesuit, <laughs> the spacesuit defies thermodynamics. Why isn't that spacesuit a basketball? Basically, you pump air into a basketball, you can't crush it with your hands. It's really taut, right? It's tight. You can't you can't burst it. Well, then why? Well, it's because you put pressure inside it, right? It's not even, you know, it's a little bit more pressure on the inside versus outside. Well, here on the moon you're talking about pressure on the inside and no pressure on the outside on the outside those things should have turned into parade floats. Inside out. they should have yeah. burst and it never ever ever happens and it's just oh my god it's just I mean, anyway but again people we get away they get away with it because we're not taught we're not we're it's like the population is only given enough information to make them functional and yeah. that's really it well, what's mo most remarkable about us having this conversation right now is that we're living through an event just like this. <laughs> oh, you want to you want to go there? <laughs> Hold on, before we go there, I want to check the chat before we before we go to twenty twenty. Yeah. Because uh, I think we butchered NASA enough. I know they're working on something else. I just wish they tell us what it really was. But so, the I don't think. Uh, how do I say it? How do I say? It? So we we went through the fact that apparently something something or someone put us here. And we're in some type of artificial construct. Right. So much so, some of your biggest and brightest, quote unquote, pseudo scientists are saying, yeah, that simulation theory will explain this all the way. Let's get on that bandwagon with the quantum computers. Well, as a matter of fact, they just said NASA discovered a parallel universe. I was like, wait a minute, what was NASA in the parallel universe business? Right. So, right. Well, I mean, come on, let's face it. Um, I, I would love to talk about virtual stuff, but most people wouldn't, wouldn't understand it. And by that, I mean, look, the Matrix is 21 years old now. And the Matrix yes. was about as high end of virtual reality explanation as you could get. I mean, it, took, it was a freaking trilogy. And people, I mean, it resonated and made a lot of money, but people was, it was mostly an action film, whereas people still didn't get the underlying premise. And that is, you can fool the human mind with a simulation if you really, really had the tech to do it. Um, we see things in our world now that the better movie to watch would have been the movie that the, you know, because everything in Hollywood is in twos. You know, they, they, there's more than one studio making the same theme. The other one was the 13th Floor. That was the more brilliant movie. Um, 13th Floor was a, a remake of a German film from 1975 called World on a Wire, uh, which was like, you think uh, simulation theory was hard to do now. <laughs> Imagine doing it in the 1970s, which was based on a 1960s book uh, called Simulcron 3, 
which was that in our process to build a simulation, we figured out we ourselves were in a simulation. That's the, that's yes. the, the, the twist ending. And we see things now in our world that we do in computer simulations. Uh, the, the most obvious being the double slit experiment, which again, science does not like talking about because they can't explain it. The double slit experiment is something that happens in the graphics world. In the graphics world, in simulations, I don't care if it's military or entertainment or GTA or Warcraft or freaking Fortnite, I don't care. When you're not looking at something, it's not being rendered. Meaning it's uh, whatever's behind you. If you're not looking at it, there's no reason to draw it in its higher rendering form because you're not looking at it. It's called um, like flashlight graphics. So if you're walking around a room you can o with a flashlight, a dark room, you can only see the things that the flashlight are on. Why? Because that's what you're pointing at. That's what you're seeing. Well, that's happening. That happens in our world as well. And nobody, nobody likes to talk about it. So and what I mean is when you're measuring something with a single electron gun, you're firing stuff in. This is the double slit experiment in a nutshell. If you're not watching it, if you're watching it, it's rendering. If you're yes. not watching it, it's not rendering. <laughs> yes. And and yes. and that just that is just blows my mind because we didn't even know what that meant until we started making our own simulations. Own computers. Yeah, right. our own computer stuff because that's it's called conservation of resources. It's something we do in computers to save resources, which is there's no reason to if your if your character is never going to be on the other side of that mountain, there's no reason to draw the other side of that mountain. Plain and simple. And you can even take it down to, if you look, if your character is not on the next street over, don't draw the name of the street. It's just black. It's just nothing. There's nothing happening there. And we see this in real life. So when scientists come on and, and talk about simulations, like, yeah, great, fantastic. But the public isn't going to get it because, which is why I start out with Flat Earth. But the longer yes. version, which was in my, my book as of late, which was if it's flat and enclosed, if we're living in a building, eh, it's probably digital. Probably. Although who yes. cares from our standpoint, because it's real to us, but outside yes. of our world, it's probably digital, which I'd say, and I'm not being insulting in any way. When I say this, I go, God's a programmer, plain and simple, you know, because we can, we can now say that because we know what programming is before computers. God was obviously making stuff with magic hammers and chisels and stuff that, you know, tools that were available to us. But now that we're, we're into computer technology, well, there you go. Wow. I'm on the same wavelength. I got there from a different trajectory, unfortunately. I've gotten really deep into some of the old occult stuff. And, you know, a lot of people stop at, for instance, with The Matrix, which is interesting about that, is that Sophia Stewart, who um, wrote the preliminary scripts for it, she's been vocal lately. She's done a lot of podcasts and she has a lot of different conversations that are beyond The Matrix. And she always points back to some of the old religions where she was nudged back in her childhood. Um, if I go further back, we get into like Crowley, Blavatsky and those people. I went further back than them and went to Pascal. And Pascal wrote almost a hundred books in America. And, th and this is a African-American man during the Civil War era, um, talking to spirits and bringing Rosicrucianism to America and exploring some of these ideas of what we would understand now as parallel realities. And of course my favorite was uh, Philip K. Dick and some of the things that he's been captured saying about multiple realities and some of the books, his Blade Runner, Man on High Castle, things like that. We have a lot of these brilliant minds all in the echo chamber, it would seem, to nudge people to say, hey, guys, by the way, this isn't quite real. Um, I mean, even Oprah's doing it, right, with the law of attraction. Like, think how stupendous that is. If you close your eyes and say something and convince your mind or subconscious mind that it can be, then reality through this, uh, you know, experiment gets to manifest it for you. And even though you probably can't get the million dollars or the yacht you really want, but there's enough other smaller things that everyone could attest to that starts with just the idea. So what is doing that? What is what is delivering these goods to you? Um, and if you had more credit, could you order more? Like a video game would, right? right. Like it doesn't matter if you have mana or magic or not, do you have the skill? Do you have the level to wield that skill? And I think a lot of people jump the line and say, oh man, I can't carry this sword, so the sword's no good. You know, and, and we do that with our reality as well. So yeah, it's it's very mind blowing, man. Yeah, I mean, again, I I, I love the whole virtual reality concept, um, but I have to start out. You know, the the lowest common denominator thing is it's flat, and then people mm -hmm. can kind of work their way up from there. But 
honestly, after five years, uh, people, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people that are getting into the little flat side of thing. The virtual side of thing, just, you got to be into tech, which is so strange because everyone, you know, w there's so many people that play video games. And it's like, what do you think yeah. Fortnite is based off of? Or GTA or, or Warcraft or freaking Minecraft, all that stuff. It's based off the same technology. They play it, but they don't understand it. Sort of like, um, uh, oh, hell, let's go even simpler. The microwave, you know, 99% of people own a, a microwave, but almost none, almost none of those people know how it works at all. They just want it right. to work. They know it works. It's like you put in things, you hit the button, things heat up. Sometimes it's, in, it's inconsistent. They don't know why. They don't know any of that stuff. Uh, why? Because why would they? They don't, they don't care. It's same thing with, you know, asking the average person, we'll, we'll take a, a notch up. It's like everyone uses their smartphones. Very few people know, with the exception of some of the, even the programmers. I mean, you, if you're an engineer, you might know some of the hardware. If you're a programmer, you might know some of the apps. But reverse engineering, reverse engineering a smartphone would be impossible for most people. Right. Hmm. And have you ever had this experience, Mark, just in real life in terms of like glitches in the matrix where something that wasn't supposed to work, maybe electronic, maybe, I don't know, any electronics is probably more practical to talk about. Hmm. But let's say you turned on something and it wasn't supposed to be on because the battery died. And the moment you thought about it, it turned off. Or, or like a, or like answering a phone call and it wasn't plugged into the wall, or turning on a light switch and the light bulb wasn't there. You know, or any kind of. Yeah. There's been a lot of little weird moments in my life where I don't know. I mean, I'm so open-minded about stuff that I don't even question it. If something works or doesn't work, I have. I am a huge believer in karma. I am a huge believer in fate. The things you know, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And I've seen too many things in my life that happen just because they, they look, felt like they were meant to happen. Like the timing. Video games are all about timing. It's not just about thresholds and, um, and actions. You know, you reach a certain threshold, then, then action happens. It's also, about, you know, the other side is timing. And you can feel it in games, right? So, you know, or, or, or more often, oh, sorry, let's, let's take out games, television shows. Things happen in television yeah. shows during certain points because they have to. Because you have to keep the plot going. You can't just, you can't just sit there and do nothing for, for a while. And does it happen in real life? Yeah. Yeah, you bet it does. Which means, I'll, 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 you want me to blow your mind even further? Go There's sometimes that I've even I've even gone one step further and I've said forget about the the virtual reality side of things. What if it's not a virtual reality? Because virtual reality is actually not very efficient. And what kind of clued me into this was walkthroughs. You know, people are especially kids. Kids are so lazy now they don't even play their own video games. They just they just look it up. Well, they watch yeah. people make, playing video games. <laughs> they, yes. they but watch YouTube. It's like wait, you're watching a YouTube thing of I mean, forget the walkthrough of how to do it. You're not even going to play it. You're just going to watch a guy walking through a video game. Well, technically, that uses up far less resources than actually playing the game. So it got me kind of thinking, um, which was, what if you're not living in an in a interactive game? What if you're living in sort of a virtual movie? Yes. Meaning, because th th I'll, I'll give you a, a quick Hollywood example. Let's say you're a director of a movie. You had total control. Forget about the producers. You have total control of the movie. Every decision in that movie was made by you. And you finish the movie, and a week later, before it's released, you bump your head on a tree, and you forget that you ever made the movie at all. But then somebody takes you to see the movie. Well, to anybody else in the theater, it's like, yeah, it's a movie, right? But for you, it would be the greatest thing ever because every decision that was made in that movie, you would have made. It's like, wow, I would have used this music. Those actors are perfect. That dialogue is perfect. <laughs> Everything would have yeah. been perfect to you. All you need is to remove the memory because it takes away. Talk about conservation of resources because, because at that point, you're talking about a path through the game which is very, very narrow. But if you choose it ahead of time, then, and you get rid of the memory, then all the choices you, they were made up at that point, you've already made, which leads into the line from the matrix that most people missed when the Oracle was talking to Neo and the park bench where he goes, he goes, I can't make that choice. And she goes, she goes, it's not a, she goes, you don't have to make the choice. You've already made it. You're here to right. figure out why you made it. Yes, which I remember mean, that. Which means, you know, he made these decisions ahead of time. 
you know, there's a lot of underlying stuff. And I know the Wachowskis didn't write it, but whoever wrote it had a lot of brilliance in that, in that thinking, which was, it, that's how I would do it, which is you don't random interactive, you know, where things are live as they happen. No, most of our media is not live. Very few things are live. Why would you make right. it live? If you do a production, a pre-recorded production, you can make it perfect. You can make it exactly the way you want. And so that's what I kind of, I'll, I'll lead you one more thing into that, <laughs> which will kind of give you, and then we can switch off to wherever, wherever you, what you want. Um, if you get a chance, anyone's listening to this, look up something called, forget about the double slit experiment, look up something called uh, neuroscience and free will. It's in wiki. It's actually a wiki entry which is something they've done television specials on this and science doesn't like talking about this either even though it was a scientist that came up with it you <laughs> the standard thing you have somebody sit down in front of a computer attach little electrodes to their head and you say okay start picking numbers at a certain point and notice and note the time you know it's going to be in seconds and tenths of seconds on the screen and note that not only when you when you hit the button but when you decided to hit the button so for most people it'd be like, ah, I'm gonna pick the number four. And the second you, you know, within a second or so, after you say, you think that, you hit the number four. Well, here's where it gets interesting. The computer, of course, isn't sophisticated enough to tell you what number you're gonna pick, but it could tell you exactly when you were gonna hit that keyboard. In fact, the computer could tell you because your brain waves were ramping up for eight seconds before you hit that keyboard. Correct. Well, that's impossible <laughs> because if I think I'm gonna hit the number four now, right? That's what, a second or two at most? And yet the computer is yeah. already anticipating the, the your brain is already firing up basically eight seconds before you even consciously said the number four in your head. How does that, yes. how is that possible? And the reason why they call the experiment neuroscience versus free will is because that's predestination, which means that you did, yes. you, you, you had no free will. You made that decision before you made the decision. You made it before you were even consciously aware of it. In fact, you were being fed data to choose it. And and again, science hates using, you know, hates looking at stuff like predestination. It's like, no, we have total free will. It's like, yeah, but only because we're in it. We perceive free will. But if you make all your decisions beforehand, it's sort of like the, um, uh, sorry, I don't mean to ramble too much. But okay. there's sort of that, that you've seen this in different future movies, time travel movies. And that is if you don't go back and change the future, like this guy is always going to run the stop sign, right? Well, if you don't stop, you know, if you don't stop him from running the, the intersection, he's always going to run the intersection. The thing is, yes. as an observer, you watched this happen, right? You, you saw it happen ahead of time. So for you from the outside, it's predestination. And, you know, all you have to do at that point is, is you know, the, if you removed his memory, if you, he decided at some point, you know, before he came in here, that he was going to run the intersection and then remove that memory, that's all you needed to do. All it is is memory. Memory is a funny, funny thing. And it's, uh, yeah. it is, you know, it, again, part of the Matrix where, you know, they condensed, they didn't show what happened where, like, when Neo learned all the, the martial arts, right? Happened in seconds. Mm -hmm. In, in the computer world, it happened in seconds. But in his mind, which they didn't, you never ever saw, he had to go through tons and tons and tons of classes. But they weren't going to, for whatever reason, they didn't show those huge montages. Time is infinitely relative. And it's, oh, yeah. Sorry, we get into that for a long time. but No, I, I get it. I think our subconscious mind, or how, how do I put it? I think the best way to, to uh, put it is that the human body, the animal part of us, yeah might have more than one driver <laughs> oh yeah 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 well it's probably so i think the dvr is recording it slower than the uh the spirit or soul that's doing there you go so like we have like a buffer or something or a decompression uh wall that you know may account for some of those things yeah well or, or to boil it down even further are we the player or are we actually playing ourselves yikes yeah i know oh i mean is that is that a bad thing not necessarily I mean, you know, because that's what you'd want to do. You'd want to be, you know, I mean, how many video games do we wish? So it's like, wow, I wish I was in there, you know, doing that. But uh, it's it's a it's, it's a tricky thing. Because... With an eight second millisecond latency delay, like, yeah, I'm going to pick the number eight and then you choose it on the controller. And then the mind that you're driving goes, yeah, we're going to pick number eight. Yeah. One second. Boom. It's eight. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that then it's like, where did that signal come from? Exactly. Because it came along you know, before you you made the call. 
And people, when they show it, in fact, you can watch the television specials on this. You know, when they, when they, you know, pick a journalist and have him do it, it freaks him out. He, he doesn't know what to do. It's like, he, he goes, he can't be. It, it's impossible because we can't think outside of our own consciousness. If I think of the color green, well, I just thought of the color green. I originated it. Nothing drove me to picking the color green except for me. Well, except that we knew that you, there's something else going on that picked you, you had picked that green eight seconds before you picked it. It's like, ah, uh, it, yeah, it bugs, it, it irritates people because then it's, it's outside of our, we don't like to think outside of our consciousness, you know, outside of ourselves, but that's what we're talking about. So anyway, what, well, let, let's shift to something else. Yeah, man, let's, let's go to 2020, man. I've, I've been listening to some of your more recent podcasts lately. Uh -huh. <laughs> As it pertains to the things going on, we don't have a good code word for it, but I know YouTube likes to bug out anytime I say it. So no, you can I say, will just, say, say just say virus. Is you can say virus. They don't, as long as you don't okay. say the, the, the C word, they they okay. tend to be fine. Or put it in the title or don't put it in the description either. I mean, they they okay. really monitor titles and descriptions. But, um, and, and I know people, some people use the code word, but I've said it on many a thing and I've never gotten flagged for it as, as long as you don't criticize it what the, the what youtube changed recently was they will come down remember it's a private company they can do whatever they want um yeah. they will come down on anyone that accuses anything of being a false flag whether it be a shooting or a bomb or uh, or even a virus you can't say you you can't i shouldn't say false flag um you can't you can't accuse anything of being a false flag they will they nice. will just remove it entirely and and put potentially hit you with a community guideline thing which is different from a copyright thing so when it comes to the virus what, what's happening now it the reason why it's it's I, and i'm i'm not necessarily obsessed with it it's just that as i'm watching the news and mainstream media i'm trying to figure out what the bigger game is because there's a game to this it is nothing to do the virus is just hype the virus is just a a a, a a, a framework for something else that's happening because yeah. because it doesn't make sense we we've gone through things we've gone through swine flu and west nile and ebola and all, all the other crap we've gone through nobody's done anything there's in fact the you know the 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 line i like to use uh which goes well i know no one was around 100 years ago which was the 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 gold standard was the uh, the pandemic of the spanish flu which supposedly killed one mm -hmm. percent of the population and, and, and I believe it, right? 1% of the population. And people, people understand, that's a lot of people. That's a huge amount. It's one out of every 100 people you know. It's gone. One out of, and that's right. the whole world. And if you applied that to the world right now, that would be 78 million people, which is ridiculous. Yeah. That's bodies in the streets. That is huge amounts of people. And that's what they said was going to happen. They said, oh, yeah, 1%. That's the mortality rate. Well, here we are five months later, five months later, and, you know, 1% of the population is 78 million. Well, 10% of that is 7.8 million. 10% of that is 780,000. We're at what? 300,000? So yeah. half of 10% of 10% of 1%. That's, yes. that's where we are. It's like, and you've shut down the, the world's economy. I mean, crippled it. The, the, ram, the ripples from this are going to extend for a long time. And it's going to be really, really, really painful. And uh, economically. So what again? What's the goal here? I mean, are you are you really think you can do like a, a forced vaccine, forced forced test? <laughs> Maybe in other countries, not mm -hmm. in the United States. Not in this one. No, no. Right. I mean, we the to give you a perfect example. The governor of, of Washington, where I am, up in the northwest corner of the United States, uh, he tried to do he tried to pass a thing where he was going to require restaurants that opened they would keep a logbook. Meaning, when you came in, you had to give people your name, your email address, everything. Basically, you had to you had to you had to log in. <laughs> I know, right? And then you had to check in with them when you left. <laughs> and and th it, that didn't even last a week. It was gone within a week. It was like, yeah, we're, we're abandoning that. We couldn't even keep people from going to the beaches and the parks. Facts. <laughs> and Florida, California, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Pe people, people, yeah. I mean, you saw what potentially you could do. And yeah, you found out there are a lot of people that would snitch on other people. That part pissed me off to no end. But the but it is just hype. I mean, the, the numbers are ridiculous. And in fact, I got into a thing with a podcast guy just a couple of days ago uh, out of the UK where he was saying, you know, you would open up. I go, absolutely, I'd, I'd open up. I go, look. This is America. This is 
you know, lives, all the, you know, a few lives comparatively versus all the jobs, <laughs> there, there's no contest. I go, we, the United States lets people die for money. We do all the time. We have all throughout our, our history. And, and if that's even if you believe that they actually died from, from Corona. From the causes, yeah. Uh, the, the line I like to throw at people, again, if they're skeptical in any way, it's like, fine. I, and granted, I can't speak because my contact list is very, very small. But think of the contact list on your phone. Pretty big. Mm -hmm. Is Did you have to remove anybody from that list because they died from the virus? No, you didn't. No. You didn't. Your friends didn't. Nobody did. And even if you can find somebody, because the only people I ever heard of, it's like, oh, a friend of a friend and somebody's uncle. It's like, really? <laughs> that's yeah, two or three. It's constantly years. someone's friends, that's, family, older family member. Yeah, that's not how it works. Even if you could find somebody, did they, my new rule is, did you get struck down? Meaning where it was a perfectly healthy person that was jogging one day and six days later they were dead. <laughs> that right. didn't, didn't, didn't happen. Didn't actually happen. Like it happened in other countries. Like when it first happened, when they were making the mall rounds around February, March, yeah. whenever it was in Iran, we, we were, they were telling us that military health officials were struck down within three days. Yeah. Which was, we have, yeah. Which, which of course, since they were in a hostile nation very well could be, but that wouldn't have been the virus. Right. That's, that's, that's a whole nother thing. But, but the big thing is like, look, if it is an actual bona fide pandemic, you would know dead people. And I'm not trying to be callous or glib when I say this. I'm saying that one of your family members would be dead. The guy that works at the garage, he's dead. Your dental hygienist, dead. <laughs> you know yeah. all sorts of people. And, and, that's, and that's when people, which is why people didn't take it seriously. And they went to the parks and the beaches. And it's like, screw this. We're going out. Because nobody knew anybody. There was no fear. Nothing hit home. I mean, it's, which is why, and you've heard me say this in my thing. It's uh, I call it the no zombie scenario. I've been really following a lot of zombie stuff in the background. I've been following Z Nation <laughs> recently, but I call it the no zombie scenario, which is the news could come out tomorrow and run zombie stories, and they could say, "Oh, zombies here, zombies there, zombies everywhere. Be really escape, you know, afraid. Lock your doors, pull your curtains. There's zombies." And for a little while, that might actually work. You know, why not? You know, run a couple snapshots of zombies. You know, you you could fake it actually pretty well. The problem is, is eventually. People are going to have to see zombies. They're going to have yeah. to see them from everywhere, from the big cities to the small towns. People are going to have to see zombies. And if they don't, eventually you're going to get that moment. It's like, hey, Tom, you see any zombies? No, nope. Fred, you see any zombies? Oh, hell, let's go back to work. <laughs> because that's what yeah. they would do. They would go back to work because there's no, the threat isn't there. The threat isn't scary enough. And, and people say, well, are you, what are you saying? I'm saying that you can make the numbers as high as you want. The numbers now, of course, you know, they're going to they're gonna take this thing into six figures. Say 100,000 people died. Great. Where are they? You know, and by mm. the way, that's five months. 100,000 people in five months in a nation of 350 million? That's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. I mean, come on. We don't take, we, the United States does not take death that seriously. Never has. I mean, Never come, has. come on. How many, how many millions of people have died from cigarettes? None of those companies have closed down. They're all open. We never right. shut down anything. You know, AIDS, AIDS killed a whole bunch of people, including an entire generation of hemoph hemophiliacs. Did we ban gay people? Nope. nope. You know, we didn't do any of that stuff. So what happened? What is, what, there's a secondary thing for this. Meaning, what is ha what is going to follow this? You know, what are you setting this up for? And people are saying, well, it's a mutation, or they're saying it's a forced vaccination. It's like, yeah, but I mean, come on, we're we're a sue happy group in the United States. We will sue at the drop of a hat for anything. And you're you're going to try to what? Go door to door and try to force vaccination on some people? How's that going to go in the cities? By the way. How are you going to do that? And and what, what personnel are you going to do it with? Because you can't do it everywhere simultaneously. You're going to what? Start no, on, you sure can. You're going to start on the East Coast? Going to start on the West Coast? Where are, you going to, where are you going to start with this? Because once, you know, social media, now it's instant. Once you start rolling that thing out, people are going to talk. And the first, yeah. I mean, I'm, whether it's real or not, you know, let's, let's go worst case scenario. The first person that says, oh my God, I got a side effect from the virus. My arm fell off. The mm. first person that posts that, that's it you will have people just they're just going to lock their doors they're not going to answer them. everyone becomes skittish oh right? yeah people are like yeah. knock 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 what are you going to at that point and by the way if you're if they go house to house and your door is locked what are you going to do then now the only thing they could do and if you you know what i'm going where i'm going here is you could say well you don't get to work at our company 
unless you until you bring in some papers yeah unless yeah. you bring in the papers now of course that leads to black market papers or you know the underground mm -hmm. paper thing and you know and by the way is it what just one group that can certify this or you know people are going to be circulating like false stuff all you know are you gonna do a hologram thing like money what you're gonna do watermarks how are you gonna pull this off it's just too tough to do and people say oh martial law you know i i, I don't want to diminish this too much but martial law is too difficult there's only two million i think active military in the united states not yeah. that many well two million is nothing and i mean if you want the national guard to even lock down california all of the national guard it would take some doing to seal off all of california and that's one state what do you what do you do for new york or florida or the middle of the country and, and how, how do you pull this off martial law no sorry there isn't enough people for martial law and you don't need it because people are self-governing yes uh, people are telling on each other they yeah. are every hotline every hot without fail not just our country every country every country that is open and state that has opened up a hotline a tip hotline you know snitch on your neighbor if they're if they're so not social distancing freaking they get overloaded almost immediately people call up you know behind their you know looking through their blinds going oh my god i don't like the look of that barbecue <laughs> damn it karen <laughs> and they and they will they will call in and they just it just gets it's staggering to me um that the people will do this and to where and peer pressure is a powerful thing i know i'm old but you gotta remember that like it did not take much once the cool kids started wearing levi's 501s in, in high school everyone was wearing them everyone got them. because why not i mean the cool kids know something we should wear the same jeans and then everybody was i mean without even i think it was funny that people were um buying out masks you know back in february right they were selling out of masks back in february before anyone even mentioned masks because they kept showing thumbnails of asian people wearing masks but no one was wearing them on the streets now right well then it started out one in three people wearing masks and then two and three and then three three out of four now i think it's like four out of five people are wearing masks you know just voluntarily in some places because you know they're they're afraid of peer pressure they don't want to be they don't want to stand out they don't want to be judged by people in the grocery store yeah i mean i'm i'm waiting for someone to come up to me i've got like half a dozen lines to give to people if they actually came up and say why aren't you wearing a mask well, my opening line will be oh i don't know because the surgeon general told us not to wear masks for five weeks Yes. And the president, and then, the president, which I love, even I, I never voted, but I love this line, which was, he's like, yeah, we're recommending masks. Oh no, I'm not wearing one. <laughs> like, why would he? Yeah. It's bad television. Um, yeah. even the Rover. And he's just walking through all the showings that they're doing of the factories and the meetups. He's like, no, I'm not wearing a mask. Yeah. And, and of course, more recently, social media has been kind of vigilant showing the, uh, the anchors or the interviewers and the media journalists. Yep they'll have the mask on camera and when they think the camera's off first thing they do is peel it off their face yep. and i was like come on guys like yeah. it, that but that feels like that nasa moment man it almost feels like they're doing that to the effect of what they did with some of the nasa stuff yeah it's like they're showing you like the editor or whoever's in the office has to be able to cut that or crop that out right. but they're not right well yeah. every once in a while you, you get guys that make mistakes um one of my favorites and and you can look this up would be the um the sandy hook thing where um um uh, Robbie Parker was, you know, the father of one of the kids that was was shot. Went on CNN Live twenty four hours later. He didn't know he Sorry, was live. Yeah. And because it was a live feed, he was, you know, was laughing and joking. Then he gets up to the podium and gets into, "I'm so sad" and blah blah blah. It's like, mm -hmm. dude, you were just look laughing with your buddies ten seconds earlier. The problem was that was live feed. So every once in a while, the producers can't catch it. What are you gonna do if you're a producer? It's like, holy crap he, he, he does he know he's live right now and ever now of course they chopped it out of the 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 reruns of of that interview but you know it's still out there and the the saying which i love which is everything on the internet sticks if it's out there it, you know it's out there people record everything now so. yeah i've seen i've seen all of that stuff i followed quite a few other events that they like to forget about and they haven't mentioned since I know there was a very particular event in Nevada that no one has talked about since it happened. And I always thought that was really curious. You know, that always bothered that is me. funny you'd mention that. I was looking through my old folders and I kept a folder on, I, I know which one you're talking about, the whole Vegas thing. And you're absolutely right. Nobody talks about the Vegas thing. It's, uh, it, it, it was, well, I'm, I'm only going to say it from a firearms point of view because I'm a big firearms advocate, which is, mm -hmm. 
look, you could ask, and anyone, I've asked all sorts of people this. I go, look, if you're a shooter, somebody pays you a million dollars to, to make that shot, you know, from that particular hotel room, you know, those, those shots, are you going to, are you going to choose an AR-15? Are you going to use a, a five, 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 six? No, nobody, nobody ever choose that weapon. And that's all he had was like a stack of these things and supposedly went through like 1500 rounds and yet there was only like 100 rounds on the floor oh my god it just went on and on it's like logistically everything was wrong about that uh everything was wrong about that and the fact that no one not even politicians or people on tv use it as a point of reference to make an argument no anymore. they don't it was dissected now that being said one of our members one of the flyers community members was there in the crowd um, wow. so no, do I think something happened and the crowd had to scatter? Yeah, I do. I, I do think there was mm -hmm. some real shots fired. Um, do I think it was from that window? No, I don't. Um, but I do think something happened, but I don't know what I, I don't be again. I, I absolutely trust this woman who was there. Uh, I know her very well. No, well, I shouldn't say I, her I think, very well. I think they do know what happened there. I think when you start looking into who owned the hotel and you go down that rabbit hole of their relationships with politicians and yeah. you'll start to see like there's this web that's forming that matter of fact, I would say the last 20 years, every major event that we see on media that we can laugh at yeah. all of those actors for whatever reason, the current president decided to put them on notice. And I think that's the most remarkable conspiracy coincidence I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Because if you if you've been following this storyline, if you've been playing this game a while, you go, what? They're investigating who for doing what? Isn't that the guy that owned this and building seven insurance and this and that and third? And you start to see him. You you people are finally able to put all of these people in the same room now. Right. And um Trump Trump has been the guy to do that, and it's alarming to a lot of people because a lot of people want to dislike him um because there's things to dislike, and other people are afraid to think it's funny. You know, because social conditioning, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Me personally, I think it is hilarious. Like, if this actually happens and they're using this quote unquote moment as a cover story to expose the last 20 years, or if not more, of propaganda and problems behind the scenes, and they actually bring some of that to light to the American public, I don't even think they always say aliens is going to be a system shock. I think this is going to be more of a system shock than an alien would. I'm I'm waiting for them to figure out why they got us sitting in the house and why California wants to uh you know extend its stay for three more months and you know the the, the real the real conversation right now that people are having mainstream yeah. is like oh you know they're trying to run it parallel with the election so like you start thinking about votes and mail-in ballots and stuff like that but no 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 it's like what you said you're like do you want all those mothers driving on the highway trying to find their kids right. well yeah I mean if, if they say something crazy right yeah now. it's yeah. disaster movie 101 which is you you read the, the only reason disaster movies are even as long as they are is because everybody's looking for a family member when the disaster strikes. So whatever's happening here, again, I don't know what they're... The, the thing that's kind of ticking me off right now is I don't know what they're waiting for, which is, look, I, I consider myself a, a fairly intelligent person, and the timing is now. We're, we're in the window right now, so what the hell are you doing? You can't tell me you're just going to back out of this thing. Because, again, if you try to back out of this now... You're looking at the very least a new depression, but not, we're not talking recession here. We're talking full blown depression because once people, I mean, the restrictions, first off, people coming back into the, you know, the workforce, the restrictions yeah. are over the top. I've never seen it. The restaurant industry is dead. They're gone. There's no restaurant can open. No, no Ross restaurant is sustainable at, with the restrictions they're going to put in place. Retail is dead. Movie theater is gone. I mean, you're talking at this point. I know they're thinking of like, for example, of opening major league baseball, mm -hmm. but if you want to, a little precursor of how that's going to work out, look at what just happened in Germany where Germany opened up some of their soccer fields. Right. And the journalists mm -hmm. were there writing about, it and they're saying it's just freaking haunting because they have to sit in a certain part of the, the stands. There's no one there. I can, I know exactly what's going to happen with major league baseball. Here's my prediction, right? Ready? Right. <laughs> First home run that's hit in a major league park. And they follow that ball out there and it just rattles around the stands and nobody's chasing it because no one's there. <laughs> it, it, it'll just echo through, you know, through the park. Sorry, that's it. I and mean, there's there's no fun to be had there. A major league, or sorry, national football, you know, really? The NFL? What's, what's the point? I predict that there will be massive 
um, people in the industry. If you have the money to retire, there will be all these guys will just early, early retire. I mean, LeBron, for example. And I know he just did that graduation thing with Obama and you know, those other things. But if you're LeBron, do you really hang out? Do you really do it? I mean, what's what's the point? You're there to dunk and get the fans charged up. Uh, you yeah. know, playing for an empty arena. He was one of the first people that said, "I won't play if there's an empty arena." And then the NFL right. can, or the NBA canceled their season. So there's so many things that are going to change, and there's so many things people don't just don't get it. They treat it like a snow day at first, like a snow week. Yes. And now it's like, you you don't understand like the job market will be. You thought it was tough. The job market was tough before. Think of now. But where there's corporations that aren't even open anymore, and the ones that are open, they're they're going to reduce staff. Find me somebody that's going to f- just fire everything up, but you know, full blown again. Even the food industries mm. are cutting back because you know the, because the restaurants in it. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom here. I'm just saying that if you and you heard me say this in one of my spe- my speech things, which is if you try to back try to back out of this, <laughs> it's probably actually going to be worse than if you just didn't push forward. You know, and, and just, just look, don't forget this Band-Aid coming off slow thing. Whatever you're going to do, just do it. Because yeah. you're, you're with the slow suffering that will occur. You're talking about a whole new wave of homeless people. And yeah. pe- people also forget that before somebody goes homeless, they commit crimes. <laughs> they have, that's yeah. you, If you're desperate enough, it's like, well, hell, I'm tomorrow. Next week, I'm going to be homeless. I might as well rob a liquor store. Next week I'm going to be homeless. I might as well do this. You know, th- multiply that by a lot of people. Now think about that. All those crimes. Now you need it's because you're still using the cover of a virus. Yeah. Now there has to also be a whole nother protocol for pursuing criminals. Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't even think about that in, in a serious way. Like when you put them in the cells, how do you do it? When you go to court and you have to do that, how do you do it? When you put them in the car in the back seat, how do you do it? Yeah. And I'm not talking about right now. I'm talking about when it goes lawless 2.0 because of those reasons you stated in a couple of months when unemployment really dries up and they decide not to do any more stimulus packages yeah. and a lot of people are going to be forced to feed their kids and they're going to do it by any means necessary so you, you're not going to you don't even have a protocol to stop them from doing that the, and i think that's what kind of spooks me a little bit the only thing uh and i, I unfortunately I do have to a dinner thing i've got to do here in a, in a little bit understood but but i want to i want to get this point across which is the only thing that's keeping everybody sane throughout this this whole virus thing is that the food distribution lines are running mostly intact and i say mostly because the grocery stores and i have noticed it in various grocery stores because i i'm I'm trying i'm looking for the signs which is there are gaps in the aisles meaning there there shouldn't be i mean yeah fine you can find some toilet paper people mostly got that out of their system still trying to figure that one out but there are other gaps in different aisles which aren't being filled in, and, and there's gaps that shouldn't be there. Um, kind of like the, um, the, the Hawaii person that called in on a, on a show I was in recently. And I said, Hot, what's over? She goes, it's interesting. She goes, there's, the canned goods are mostly gone. And it made sense yeah. because, remember, Hawaii has to have everything imported. And canned goods weigh a lot. So they have paper products because you can stuff a whole bunch of paper products on, on planes. But canned goods, they, they weigh quite a bit. And if you have limited amounts of flights that are coming in, there's, there's not as many canned goods. The only thing that's keeping everybody from freaking just turning on each other is the food lines are stable. If, yeah. if that starts to break down for whatever reason, then you know that's, that's, that's the real final trigger because people will start to lose it. It's, by the way, one of the reasons... Uh, why this this pandemic is an absolute joke now the one of the the early reasons would be like okay why didn't any of the airports close <laughs> that's an obvious one. right it's like no airports right. close you could still fly anywhere you wanted basically um, a lot of flights have been cut so you're not gonna be able to do it any time but the other thing was so your temperature testing at places like hospitals and you know like some restaurants are doing and crap like that but no one's temperature testing at grocery stores why not? You know, I know why not. That's because you know what would happen if something went wrong. You don't want that sort of panic. So if you all of a sudden go into a grocery, you have a mother of five. It's going to a grocery store. She has te- gets a temperature tested, right? And mm-hmm. they don't let you, you know, they don't let you in the store because you run a little high. What do you think is going to happen then? People are going to start freaking out. It's like, you know, they'll, they'll push their way into the store. You'd have to have cops at the stores. And yeah. I mean, again, I'm still trying to figure out things like at the airport, if, if why they're not doing temperature tests 
at the airport itself because he's like, again, you have a family. It's on vacation. You're going somewhere. Let's say your youngest temperature is running hot. What happens at that stage? Do you not? You have to pull everybody off the plane. Uh, do one of them not go? What What happens? Is does that kid get put in quarantine? There's inconsistencies that don't make any sense. So yeah, I agree. Anyway, we're we're at this weird we're at this weird crossroads. For me, we're still in the window. We're still in this. We're still waiting for the other shoe to drop. I am not exactly sure why they're waiting as as long as they have been because the timing's there. You got everyone right where you want it unless you're trying to in like amp up the stress levels you know trying to get people to to the new reality of what what life may be like i mean you could still do it afterwards i just don't think it's going to be as efficient so <laughs> that's a great summation of some of the feelings that i know a lot of my people have that i've seen on the discord and twitter social media i'm starting to see way more people who normally uh stay away from these kind of conversations start to break code go off the script, start to share more videos. I remember for past few years, you know, the older generation would share with us these chain letter type of videos. Now you're starting to see Dr. Shiva and things like that. A lot more, as I would call them, normies are sharing very similar sentiments. So, yeah, yeah I think you're right. The jig is up. The yeah. time is up. My, so my, hopefully we see some manifestation. My, my favorite thing, if anyone wants, let, let me end on this. My favorite thing, if you want to watch something, would be watch the um, the Dr. Erickson videos out of Bakersfield, California. You know, those those two doctors who were just mm -hmm. laying into the administration. You know, they were they were saying, you know, the, the media was trying to crucify and the media was saying, you know, are you saying that you guys are smarter than uh, Dr. Fauci? Right. And they're saying, no, Dr. Fauci hasn't seen a patient in 20 years. He goes, we've tested over 5,000 patients here. We, we are in the weeds. We are the boots on the ground. And we're telling you, there's lots of generals out there, you know, that don't know exactly what's happening in the battlefield. Oh, they've got, a, they've got like an overview, but they don't know. And so when, you know, when doctors come out and they, they go on YouTube and they say, look, it's not that bad. I don't know why it's being hyped up to be that bad. They're getting pushback from the media. So no, no, no. And I know the media is doing it because they, they get ratings. You know, they're, you, you could plot a graph. The more fear they, they push out there, the higher ratings they get. But right. it's, that's where we are right now. We're, the, the media has gotten the hold of most people. And why, why not? You know, we, you know the, we believe the world that is presented to us. And so when the media presents this world of disease ridden fear, that's what we're going to believe because there's no other, there's no network that came out there and said, no, that's not what's happening. I mean, Fox doing its best not to talk about the virus now, but right. everybody else is. And, you know, since you're focused on that and you're, you know, you, you're worried, uh, what, what do you do? And so, you know, don't get mad at the people that, uh, that that wear masks necessarily i'm i'm, I'm not going to get mad at them i'm just not going to talk to them that wear masks in right. public voluntarily if you have to wear a mask because you know you have to get an airplane or if you if you don't wear a mask you're not going to get food well freaking get a mask on just go ahead and put the mask yeah on. just yeah. So you can get your food i mean if you want to push it that's fine but uh it's yeah it's it's you you, are, you now know if you want to know who the sheep are now <laughs> Now, now you know for sure. <laughs> you said the sheep have a uniform. Oh man, yeah. hate to see it. Yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate you for joining us, Mark. Man, and any uh any plugs, anything coming up? Uh, any social media, um, websites? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, my books are called Flat Earth Clues, Sky's the Limit, and Flat Earth Clues: End of the World. And since my publisher wanted to jump on this, you know, I actually have a survival book out there. If it gets worse. And the power goes out. I actually wrote a book for Katrina, go figure, back, back in the day. Never published it. It's called Empty Shelves, uh, organizi Organizing Your Corner of an American Apocalypse. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's on Amazon. Uh, but if you want, you can email me. I'll send you a free PDF file of it. But it's on Amazon and Kindle, and there's an audio version of it. And uh, it's, it's totally worth it, you know, especially for Americans. You don't, have to, you don't have to stock up on anything. As long as you have this book, you probably last quite a bit longer. And of course, if you want to look at any of my stuff on YouTube, just type in Flat Earth Mark into YouTube and you will find me. There you go. Yeah, man. I appreciate you, man. Appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us, Mark. And hopefully you have a great week ahead, man. All right. You too. Thanks, man. And you're very welcome. All right. Peace.